So, Baynard Woods, I am so excited to have him here. He's the senior editor of the Baltimore City paper, um, and they've gone through some really intense transitions this year. Um, so I think him talking about this right now is especially timely. Um, just to give you kind of a quick rundown. Um, so Baynard is a prolific writer. He's an author of many books, several published essays, just to name a few publications, McSweeney's, The Georgia Review, The Millions. Um, he has a PhD in ancient philosophy. He also preaches with the rock and roll band, the ba Barnyard Sharks, which you should definitely check out in his banjo work. Uh, most recently, he had um, an op-ed piece published in the New York Times that was really well received. Um, and it was um, particularly about the relevance of alternative weekly um, newspapers in cities, um, or alt-weeklies as they're known. And so I thought I would just read a really quick excerpt from, um, from that piece that I found was really interesting and, and timely. Um, he says, an alt-weekly is connected to a city in a way that a website can never be. In Baltimore, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the population doesn't have regular internet access. The glib techno-utopians, who, I love that phrase, by the way, uh, the techno-utopians who not only foresee a paperless tomorrow, but also lobby for a paperless present, are ready to forget about these people. Alt-weeklies might not always reach everyone in the city, but at least, like the dailies, they try to be available and relevant to everyone. Um, so it's really important work that's happening, and I'm thrilled to hear what he has to say. Welcome, Boehner. So it's weird. I came to journalism through philosophy, through ancient philosophy, and particularly Socrates. And I came to believe that the only way to live a, after doing a, a lot of studies of ancient philosophy, the only way to live a truly Socratic life was to be a reporter in the modern world. And, and another way to think of that is the only way to, to really be annoying enough, to be able to be annoying enough, to be required to be annoying, is to be a reporter. And so my initial instinct, rather than giving a talk up here, my first inclination was to go around and ask each of you what freedom meant, and then needle at your answers and needle at your answers until you were annoyed enough to kill me. Um, <laughs> But instead, I figured I would, I would give, that, that's not why Creative Mornings asked me to be here, and I'm really excited to be here. I usually have a rule of not speaking to people before nine, um, but I, I decided that I'd, I'd violate that this morning. And so I think one of the reasons that I was asked was because of some of the dramas that we were involved in over the last couple months at the city paper. And initially, when, when Wesley mentioned it to me, it was that the idea was censorship. And so I think some of these are the, the reasons that it seemed like I would be a good choice to give this talk, because the dramas we were involved in did deal with freedom of the press and editorial independence. And I think using those two words together is really important in the American context, particularly where freedom and independence in this country go together so deeply with the freedom of the press that we are the country that was born with the press, that every one of the founders was first known as a writer rather than through how they were born or in some other way, and that our greatest statesman, Benjamin Franklin, was came from the press, and I would say our greatest writer, Mark Twain. And so it's something that is, is so deeply attached to the, these ideas, to the idea of being American. And so what the, the dramas involving the editorial independence were, first I assigned a review of um, the terrible country musician Jason Aldean. Um, to a guy named Travis Kitchens, and I wanted Travis Kitchens to savage this guy. Not because I don't like country music, in fact, I, I really love country music, but because I didn't believe this guy was. Now, Travis went in with a totally different mindset because he's in that world here, and he thought it would be much cooler if he really loved this guy and would really piss off people like Artie Hill and the sort of country traditionalists in town. As it happened, he really didn't like him, and it was, it was really an offensive performance where the, throughout the performance it was, are my rednecks in the house and everyone would holler and stuff and it was just, so he savaged um, the, the performance. 
And no one noticed or paid any attention for a while. It was up on our website, and like many of the blogs, it just sort of, no one paid attention until they did. And then a couple advertisers noticed it and decided that it needed to be taken down. And the editor of the paper was told to take this post down or else these advertisers would pull their, their ads from the paper. And he decided to do this, partly because um, of the amount of money that was involved in, in it, that it was, it was the number, it was a, basically a salary of a person. And so it was, it was a really difficult time for the staff and for everyone involved because it, it violated the fundamental principle of modern journalism, which is, connects to the First Amendment in the sort of slang that's used, the separation of church and state. The separation between the advertising staff, which is, is absolutely necessary for a paper to function, and the editorial staff and its editorial independence. And so we all wondered not only like, how can you trust us, but how can we trust us? So once that firewall was, was violated, a couple of weeks later we found out that we were bought by the Baltimore Sun Media Group. And in response to that, Joe McLeod's Mr. Wrong column consisted almost entirely of the word fuck. <laughs> Except that it had two other words in the middle, which were the sun. And his intention wasn't fuck the sun, his intention was fuck the sun? <laughs> Nevertheless, when it went to the, um, so it went all the way through our editorial ranks, and when it got to the printer, the printer called up the production manager and said, Hey, I think y'all sent the wrong thing, and there was just placeholder text in there. That's not really the story you mean to print, and we assured them that it was. <laughs> and they said they weren't going to print it. So we tried to print another one that was a blank column that said this column has been censored by the man as the headline. And they wouldn't print that either. And in response to that, the editor came clean about the Jason Aldean thing while also explaining what happened with the Mr. Wrong column. Now, the hand, his hand was kind of also forced in this because the Baltimore Brew came to us and said, we're interested in writing this story about this, this blog post coming down. Can you tell us what happened? So I went on the record about what happened. He went on the record, and they were going to publish this story. So he really didn't have a choice. He, he didn't have much of a choice in what we were going to do there. And this was, in the Brew's coverage of it, it was considered as censorship throughout. Um, McLeod was actually really the most, um, the least incensed about it and didn't consider it censorship. And said, when, when um, other less cool heads were going to do all kinds of other things, said that, you know, they own the press. They can do what they want to do. They, they don't have to print this. And so, in many ways, this is why I think editorial independence is one way to talk about this, because in many ways it wasn't what really we're talking about when we talk about censorship. They weren't by an out being told what to print and what not to print, but they were deciding what to print and what not to print. So by which standards the New York Times could be, and the Washington Post, and anyone else that wouldn't publish a column consisting almost solely of the word fuck would be censorious bastards. And I don't think that's true. I do think the Times really, by having decency standards, or the Sun by having decency standards, we have a cover story on John Waters coming out next week in which we're able to talk about in his new book that he develops a magic asshole that allows him to fly and sing. Um, and whereas the Sun was able to say, in a family paper, we're not able to say this. The Times, when they were covering um, A. Weiwei's uh, parody of Gangnam Style that was called Grass Mud Horse Style, which it means something in Chinese, it, the characters look almost like and sound almost like, fuck your mother, and it was a protest against state censorship the Times won't print the phrase. And so they're doing less accurate news reporting by censoring themselves in, in that way. But there's a, a much more dangerous kind of censorship that we are, are subject to than, than something like the Times, and that's simple budgetary. What we're able to cover giving the money that we have. In 2006, we had two more editors at the city paper than we have now, two more staff writers, which meant we could do twice as many things or do the things we do twice as well. 
part of that's simply budgetary, and part of that's why we need also the advertising side of that equation. And we need, in order for those to work, in order for the advertising and the editorial side to work, we need that strict independence between them. Because the advertisers also need to know the thing they're paying for is that they can trust our voice, that we're going to tell the truth. On the other hand, I think that our ability to say fuck and whatever we want like that is one of the reasons that we are valuable to the sun. That they can print ads that they can't print in the sun because we can run stories that they can't run there as well. And it's important to remember that as all this is going on, this is, is still time Shamrock. This isn't the sun that, even though in a lot of other reports, this is getting, it was getting pushed on that they were censoring us in this way. So immediately after, after the editor puts up a blog post about what our sort of wrongdoings, it disappears. It's off the site. He's out of the office and unreachable by phone. And not only is it off the site, but we realize we've lost all access to communicate with the outside world. We can't get on the site at all. And we try, start trying to figure out how to respond to this. And, and for once, our terrible systems that we had there ended up being um, working to our advantage because the music blog, it had always been a terrible pain, was separate from the rest of the site. And they hadn't shut off our access to that, just as an oversight. So when we, we were logging on, can we get on? And it was like this really dramatic, like a, a you know, it's a minor thing, but it felt like all the president's men are saying, are we going to be able to, we're fighting, you know, censorship, and this is, this is a great battle, and we're able to get on. And so what do we do with that? Well, we have access now, and it really mattered what we said, it felt like. How do we address this issue? And so, I mean, it's America, and there's censorship, and we're journalists. So what do we do? We call the CEO of the company up. We tell him that we're recording, and we get like four minutes and seven seconds before he hangs up on us. And I was going to play it today, but really all it says is, hey, why are you being a dick and not letting us do our jobs? And him saying, hey, why, I'm not being a dick, you're being dicks. And that was sort of it. So, um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's not necessarily worth playing, but we transcribed it, we put it up, and it immediately, of course, came down, and we lost all other access to, um, to the site. But in the age of, of Google cache stuff and screenshots, it went sort of all around and had a, a much broader repercussions than, um, than they'd hoped it would have. And, and it was, you know, it was really great fun, and it felt really important, and... You know, we were fighting for not only the, the kinds of things that editorial independence, but also the, the kinds of fights of, you know, that James Joyce and, and D.H. Lawrence and Henry Miller to use the kind of vocabulary that we wanted to use, to say what we wanted to say, and to do our jobs, to have the kind of editorial independence that um, we felt was necessary for us to have. And... So while on the one hand that felt like a big deal at the time, on the other hand it really wasn't. There are, are so many, and I, I think it felt like a big deal. I, I just gave a, um, moderated a panel on, on Baclav Havel's Play the Memo at, at Single Carrot. And people like Havel were really seriously censored. That whole generation of, of Eastern European dissidents of Russian um, writers, and, and right now, as what's happening in Russia, and, and to such a serious degree, what's happening in China, people are really being um, censored in a way that also makes their words matter in a way that it's hard for our Sue Havel said. He was, he was looking at their situation in Czechoslovakia and looking at our situation, and specifically in regard to um, Saul Bellow's Herzog. And he said, a professional with words goes mad in a situation where words have no weight. He clearly lacks what we do not, which is to say, a situation in, words, in which words have so much weight that you must pay quite dearly for them. And so often here in America right now, our situation is that it feels like words have no weight. Anyone can say whatever you want to say, and so no words have any meaning. Everything is everywhere on the Internet. And... So at those moments, it felt like this somehow, it really mattered, because I think maybe for the first time since they'd owned the paper, the people at Time Shamrock actually paid attention to what we said and realized that it maybe should make them angry 
um, or maybe they didn't like it. And so that was a, a cool feeling. But really, they were only exercising their rights as the owner of the press, and we were exercising our rights. And they could have fired us if they wanted to. Um, and, and in that moment, I, I had the freedom to be fired because I'd already been hired by the Sun. And so I thought, well, I could maybe get a couple day vacation if they <laughs> fire me. And then I, I, hope, I hope I will start with, with these other people soon. And my wife had just gotten tenure. So I was privileged, <laughs> which is in many cases, freedom is privilege. I was privileged to say, you know. And, that, that really takes a, a lot of privilege to be free. And these, these are the issues that are at stake right now. The Atlantic recently took a lot of flack for printing advertorial, things that look like editorial content as an advertise. There was really advertisement. And they had every right to do that. But their readers, their reporters, their editors had every right to protest against that. And then you sort of see who wins. And so it's important for you, for readers, for us as a community, to watch closely all of the papers, the magazines, the publications, the radio stations that you love. See where that money's coming from. See what they're doing with it. I love, I mean, I'd, I'd like to be an a anarcho-syndicalist collective where we could, you know, have worker control of the paper. And in fact, we tried to buy it ourselves and were, were shot down, um, you know, being just impossibly incapable of competing with, with the offer that the Sun had. But in absence of that, I much prefer that you can look through and see that we're, our editorial content is paid for by advertisements from scores or fantasies or wherever it is, and then judge the content based on that. It's much more fishy with the kind of underwriting that happens in a lot more venues. It's happening in public radio a lot more now, where you'll have an underwriter um, paying for an actual show, or the kind of things that happen on websites with pay-to-play scenarios and that aren't explicit about it. Being open about everything really matters. But there are problems with these print models. There are problems with the whole sort of newspaper scenario, even after, um, right after Watergate, when at like the high point, the Washington Post had brought down a sitting president. It already seemed like this model of advertising paid newspapers and subscription paid newspapers was starting to fail. And so I have a little clip that we're going to show from the 1977 season of the show, Lou Grant, which is, Lou Grant was Mary Tyler Moore's boss on a television program. He got laid off, and then he starts his, his spinoff, where he goes to the L.A. Trib um, and begins working again at the newspaper. And this is the most brilliant opening sequence for a show ever. So it's just one minute. So we'll watch that for a minute. It's a brilliant show that still stands out really well. Every episode sort of dramatizes some element of journalistic ethics in this way that it's really spectacular. But you can see, and it's important to know that this is television critiquing newspapers at this time. But you know, from an environmental perspective, from all of these other perspectives, you start with this beautiful bird in a tree, and then you immediately get the roar of the chainsaw. Um, and then you end up again, of course, with the bird um, after the, the missed deliveries, all of the work that we do every week, and then it's just, um, it goes into the birdcage. 
And there's something really, really telling and significant about that. Um, but there's still, and I mean, that was in, in 77. They, they got rid of that intro, by the way, the very next season and had this, this much more like boring thing that just shows the characters walking around the newsroom and, and gets rid of the sort of wry part of it. But now we can see the, the sort of prophetic nature of that, where those critiques were alive and in the air then. They're so much more powerful than now. But there still is hope. Because even though Angry Birds is more popular than any kind of, of new, any newspaper in the country, the fact that journalistic freedom is being fought against every day by the state, by the, the federal government, by local governments everywhere, means that we're doing something that's still important and we're doing something that's still right. On the one hand, the economic model can shut us out and can force things down, but it still must matter if they're going to try to stop it. So the fact that someone like Snowden would go to, you know, recently he went to, to television the other night, but would go to Glenn Greenwald initially, to a reporter in the print medium, and bring all of these accusations of spying out. The fact that these people are now um, being considered, you know, trying to be charged, that Greenwald's uh, partner is being stopped in airports, means that they care about what we're doing. And the, the new distinctions that they're trying to have every day between whistleblowing and espionage, that they're withering down, and wearing away, that speaking to a reporter can be considered espionage. And that that very issue of surveillance means that they don't have to put a reporter in jail anymore like they even did a few years ago in, in 2000 and stuff to make you reveal your sources. Because all they have to do is follow the phone records, follow the metadata. The fact that in this town that the police commissioner, Anthony Bass, is blocking out the Sun reporter, Justin Fenton, means that Fenton is doing a good job, that they won't talk to him anymore, and that they physically put guards to keep him from getting to bath. That makes me think that I'm going to read whatever he's writing twice as much as I would have before about that. Because the fact that these people are scared of it really matters. So, in some ways, we need to thank the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, and all of those other motherfuckers for keeping the Angry Birds from winning. You know, but we, as the press, are also caving in in every way on that. For access, reporters are not saying what they should be saying. Fenton could start bowing down to Bath so that they would talk to him again. Freezing out reporters is becoming more and more common. The Obama administration during the campaign wanted to vet questions in order to let you speak with the president, and in some cases even wanted to vet the story. And reporters are the ones that gave into that. News organizations, editors, the Sun's editors weren't backing up Fenton on this. This is the place where everyone needs to, for readers, viewers, all need to be vigilant because if the press is the watchdog, the only watchdog of the press is you. You're the only one who can keep us on. So, I mean, our only two options seem to be that we sink into obscurity and no one pays any attention anymore, or we get jailed by the state. But that's the way it's always been. Freedom of the press is inherently fragile. It's, it was put in the First Amendment because of its fragility. And it's not the kind of thing like Second Amendment freedom, you know, where they come and try to take your gun and so you can shoot them and protect yourself. <laughs> they come and try to take your freedom of speech, and if you don't have it, and if you don't have means of broadcasting that, then no one can hear it. If people aren't listening, then they don't hear. And so it's, it, it's born as a fragile thing. H.L. Lincoln, our greatest defender in, in Baltimore of the free press, was willing to go to jail to protect the freedom of the American Mercury, the magazine that he ran. And 
in an age where we're tempted to print only good news and all good news, he also was insistent that um, defining a newspaper as something that tells the truth no matter how unpleasant. And so both of these, these elements come together, though, to put us in such a precarious situation. First David Simon repeatedly says, we're entering a golden age of corruption, partly because we just don't have the reporters in every little town across the country to go and check those paper trails, to check the records, to follow the money in corporations and in governments alike. And so couple that with government trying to erode the freedom of the press, to take away greater freedoms each day. Right now, they just, as they're, yesterday, as they were trying to, the House passed a bill that was reining in some of the already illegal NSA spying, but in doing so, they made it clear that, the, that a journalist's correspondence with a foreign source would not be protected. And so it's they're acting like they're doing something, taking back, you know, giving us more freedom, whereas all they're doing is quitting doing part of what they were doing that was illegal while extending part of what they were doing that was illegal into legality, making it legal to, to monitor our calls with foreign sources. Right now, they're trying to deny bloggers and other people in websites. As less people, fewer people have paying jobs, staff jobs, as reporters, even freelancers, are losing the protections that you would have as a journalist. So with these two things happening, our vigilance is ever more important. And I recently heard a group of, of steel workers from Bethlehem Steel, from Sparrows Point, talking about what the loss of the mill went to them. And um, one of them, a man named Chris McLaren, is that his last name? Chris McLaren said that he can't sleep at night anymore now. Because even though he was a union representative, that he didn't fight. And he felt his whole generation went to sleep on the job and quit fighting to keep the mill there, and quit fighting to maintain what they saw as their important way of life. And I feel like that is the thing that I can't ever do and that you should never do, is wake up in a few years and not be able to sleep anymore because we were the ones that slept on the job that allowed this most fragile of our freedom, the freedom of the press, to disappear and wither away right beneath our eyes, whether it be from state control or corporate control. And so I want to help y'all with all of this, and I need y'all to help us and do your best to make sure that we're doing what we should be doing. So thanks. Um, we have like 10 minutes for questions, so if anybody has any questions, you can please feel free. Yes, in the back. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I started speaking your talk. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the question for video. Um, the question was how is the transition from um, yeah, how are things now? I mean, in these regards, things are great. So in terms of editorial independence, we've had entire editorial independence. And part of the thrill of, of knowing that they were watching when, when the Time Shamrock was actually looking what we were doing when it was ending was also going over to the sun, seeing like, well, what can we get away with? And seeing that we did this like whole issue on pot, and we had like weed reviews and all this stuff. Like, really hoping that they might be like, huh? What are you doing? But instead they asked to like get the cover blown up really big to put on um, the, the boss's wall. And so like, <laughs> I think that, that um, you know, so not to say we don't have problems, but those problems are generally more of the economic sort of variety and problems that we brought over with us of, um, you know, all newsrooms are dysfunctional families in some way. And so we're still as dysfunctional as ever. Um, there's a lot of people who've been um, with the paper or, or, you know, associated with the paper at various times over the years in here. And, and so there's always something sort of wrong, of course, but like in terms of those ways, it's, it's great. And one of the great things, I mean, we were sort of worried, we were right across the street, you know, in this, this old house over here and we're now in like the corporate 
you know, sun building, but that's been probably the best thing that's ever happened because we actually have a newsroom environment. And so instead of being someone being in a converted bathroom way down the hall, um, <laughs> and you have to actually go and make a specific decision to talk to them, you overhear someone having a conversation, and then that sparks an idea for you. And so, like, so we had a lot to learn, I think, from from the newsroom of the sun, e even though they're on separate floors and we don't have much contact with them. Um, so, you know, as it is right now, I think it's, it's uh, the transition is, is really going smoothly. Student Marsh may know more than I do uh, about other levels of things, but from where I sit, it's actually looking, it's looking pretty good. And then you had a question back there. Yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the editorial issue with the Atlantic, and I'm wondering, um, since uh, so many people are consuming um, generationally their media electronically, are you worried that we're uh, having a generational loss in media criticism or media analysis? Because you know you've got real journalism next to something about like you know who flashed a boob at pants. <laughs> uh, the question was basically, uh, do you feel like there's a generational loss in media criticism? Yeah, I mean. Tremendously, and maybe not only because of, of the web. I mean, I, I think part of, of the quote that Katie read starting about that there is a, a class loss as much as a generational loss when it comes to switching everything digital. But I mean, that report that the Times put out last week about there was their internal report about going digital, um, the death of the homepage is, is also a tremendous thing that it, you know, 10 years ago you'd wake up in the morning and go to the Times homepage to see what's happening, and now you go on Twitter. And you get to the Times eventually, but not from its homepage. And those will have, I think, tremendous difference because you will see your friend, yeah, talking about what they ate right next to um, somebody that's really, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, Justin Fenton talking about a murder happening in the city. And so I, I do think that there's, there's all kinds of, of losses, but also potential gains with that. I think it may be able to reach out beyond where, um, readerships that we don't have, but media criticism is almost non-existent in Baltimore now. And it's a shame. There, there's no one watching us internally. And if we try to watch the sun a little bit, but it's hard. We used to have people like Gotti Decker when he was at the paper and then went to the sun after that, was a media critic there, did really important, good work. And it's hard for us to have the time to do that. And they have no one to do that. If we were to try to get them to write something about anything happening in our newsroom, <laughs> we would do it. There's no one there because they're so driven by their beat. There's no so then the Baltimore Brew did write on us. Um, but do they have the money or the time? And they do great work. But to fact check what happens and losing that with websites, the fact checking process, they got a tremendous number of things wrong. They said that the Mr. Rowan column would no longer be published. That was simply not true. They said that the, they named the advertiser that was supposedly going to pull out was someone that I don't believe had ever even advertised in the paper. And no one went to check that, you know? And, and we make mistakes all the time, but we really try. And, and so we just hired a, a part-time freelance person to be in charge of the fact-checking process now, someone independently to do that. And I mean, I want to see us be right below the New Yorker because, you know, as you tell all of the fact-checkers when they come in, that is the most sacred thing it happens in the paper. Nothing else would matter if we weren't able to get that right. And so I think the loss of media criticism is, is just huge. There's a Baltimore Media Watch uh, blog, but it's, you know, I think it's a, a really young kid who, who you know, it's, it's great that he's trying to do that, but like we really need serious media criticism and it's, it's really hard to have someone with the time and the resources to do that. Good question. Try and convince that. So, um, what do you think about sort of this dynamic of the advertisers driving, driving the, the writing yeah. itself, mm -hmm. and how and how you respond to that essentially? I think that the pressure becomes ever greater as finances become ever tighter. And so, in the case of taking down that blog, I mean, on the one hand, you're if that means losing a person, which is the way it was presented to the editor, we lose a salary. That means you're able to cover less. You're, you're being censored or controlled in another way by having 
one less voice, one less perspective. Um, and so that's why I think he caved in that case. And yet I believe that it's good for both the advertisers and the editorial side, the advertising and the editorial side, to maintain that independence most strictly. I think that's ultimately what the advertisers are paying for, is to be beside that independent editorial voice. And so I think that that's a wrong-headed pressure. I think that the pressure is not, um, is panic and is a response to an immediate worry, whereas the long-term health, I think, depends on maintaining that independence, but I think a lot of people will not do that. I think there is a greater pressure to allow ad sales to dictate what's going to be printed in a publication. As space gets more valuable um, and, and or more rare, um, on, then on the other hand, infinite on the web, that's where I think it's going to matter. The advertisers will be paying for, this is something that has been vetted. This is something that does have editors, fact checkers, copy editors, and it's not just a kid in his basement putting it up. It's not just a crank in his basement putting it up. There are a lot of people, and they're fighting. They're willing to fight for what they have in there, even against the, the interest of their own advertising staff. I think people will pay money for that. Um, and that's one of the things that people will pay for. And so I think that that's, I mean, there are other interesting models. Um, I mean, we were really facing that when we wanted to buy the paper. How would that work if the editorial and the sales staff all own the paper together? How would we maintain that, that separation that we wanted to have? It would be really, really tricky. And we, because we'd all be each other's bosses. And we didn't know how that would work. It was, it was one, of the, one of the fascinating questions. Nonprofit is another model that gets sort of floated around, um, which is, is, could be an interesting possibility. But you have like, I mean, NPR stations is one of those dangers though now where you have um, a show that is underwritten by the person who's on that show and that's how you get your show. And, and so that's also, and that's a little less open about it than just having, you know, you have the ad for Scourge right beside um, Bam Savage, and you you know they want to be beside Bam Savage. Um, I think kind of piggybacking off of that, um, I'm curious to hear your viewpoint of how editorial um, advertisement for a magazine versus a newspaper really dictates content. Um, as a magazine, you're going to as, as a designer, I would tend to add to a magazine to cover the target base of preferences in developmental magazines. Give it to a different crowd than style magazines or something, you know, locally. Newspaper wise, you know, it should be about the news, not about, you know, the nice houses that are you know, featured or the, you know, party scene or whatever, just kind of social aspects. So it's a totally different market. Um, I mean, what is your kind of viewpoint of like how that advertisement dollars are being used to dictate the content? Does that make sense? Yeah. So in a different way than the magazine. Yeah, so sort of your thoughts on um, how advertisement are used in a different market for newspaper versus magazines, right. yeah. and if that drives content or not. I mean, one thing that I, I try to do is not talk about things that I don't really know much about. And <laughs> I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, my, my thought is this, that something like The Sun's mission is light for all. And so, like, yeah, that's the newspaper that, like, really is supposed, should be for the entire city and regardless of any demographic. But nevertheless, I'm sure they have all kinds of people looking at who are their readers who are and trying to get like the young people and the people who are going to be spending the advertising money. And, and um, you know, I used to write for Urbanite magazine and I know that they had a very specific sort of, their editorial and their advertising base made kind of a nice fit. And I feel like that's kind of the same at City Paper, that there's, there's, um, I mean, the people who run the ads run them because they feel like the, the stories that we write reach the people that they want, but I feel like that's really divided for us. We don't know. I don't know this from any marketing research or anything, which I, I you know, I try to say it because of that firewall of the whole, that whole side of it. Um, but I do feel like we have readers that are very different, that the arts readers, which is, I'm, I am primarily responsible for all the arts coverage. I feel like those are pretty young readers. Um, and that the Mobtown beat and you know the the 
harder news things. I feel like are a much older readership, and so I feel like that's cool in a lot of ways. And that's one of the great things about the paper is that some young kid wanting to see about this art show, you know, is accidentally going to see a thing about a murder and vice versa. The person who's wanting to read about crime is going to accidentally see something. And I feel like that is, that's what I was trying to get at is at least trying to reach the whole city. And the, the, a city is where you can accidentally bump up against people. A city is for something like this. Brings people who are different together and allows conversations to happen. And I think that that's ultimately what we provide to um, anyone is, is that chance to accidentally see something. And some people want to be way more targeted. I think that's probably not the way to go. And, and you know, that's what suburbs and stuff are like. And though no, I'm only going to read people that agree with me, and I'm only going to live with people who look like me, and I'm only going to listen to the news channel that talks like me. And I think all, I'm against all of that 100%. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it allowed me to say something I wanted to say. <laughs> Yeah, so great question. Uh, so basically, like, we're having discussions about the importance of media, criti media criticism. So why wouldn't a newspaper em essentially employ someone to do just that? I mean, they used to. And so I, I think it's, it's budgetary, but there's also other weird sort of um, quasi-ethical things. So there's a sort of rule of, like, don't punch down. You know, and so like the sun, they are like, are we gonna, is City Paper gonna go and attack some blog that's sort of starting up and trying to do their best? It'd be kind of, you know, it'd be kind of an asshole move to do that. And so, but it should be done. It would make everyone better. And so like, when we first moved into the Sun building, the first day we had a, a happy hour with some of the reporters and I begged them to like watch us closely. And you know, part of us like, oh, well, we don't want to punch down you guys. But no, please do, because that's the only way we will be better. And is if someone's watching what we do and calling us out. And there are many, many ways that our coverage needs to be better. That we need to have a broader scope, a deeper scope, go farther than we do, look at stories for longer. And, um, you know, so we try to do some media criticism ourselves, but then it also is just... Are you going to do that? And maybe the idea is, are you going to be writing about your competitors when there's so many other things to be writing about? Is it the best use of our limited resources to write about what the sun's doing when we might need to be writing about what, the, what they're doing, what the sun's not writing about what's happening at City Hall or whatever? And so, it, you know, some of it is maybe a smart choice. Um, it's a super fraught question, I, I don't know. This, I think that about Kendrick Lamar is really interesting and totally right. That, like, it should be in some ways a battle and a friendly battle. You know, David Simon's great thing about the newsroom as the, the magical place where everything can be argued uh, is, is really should be true within a newsroom. There should be a lot more argument. It's, it's the job of an editor to argue with the reporters 
And it's the job of the reporters to argue back. But too many editors now are, are, will be scared if the reporter argues back, okay, and they just let it be like, that's your job is to have an argument. It's your job to fight. And it's your job to fight with other, um, I wish we had a lot more brawls with the other places in town and stuff, you know, a little bit more um, <laughs> rip road of sort of days, I think would be a great thing to happen. If there were more than one, all weekly would be great. If there were more than one, you know, if, if there were still the, the Evening Sun even, or, or the News American or whatever to be fighting, I, I think is better for all, that, that arguments bring things out. Um, yes, I think we have time for one more question. Um, in your introduction, it was mentioned that because of the print editions that the city paper has a, much, a very broad reach and reaches people who wouldn't necessarily be able to get it uh, on the computer. Uh, obviously, the web is the future of journalism, but I'd be interested in hearing your perspective. You know, apropos Blue Grant open, but what is, what's the future of, of a print edition? I mean, I'm going to repeat really quick. Um, basically, like, what is the future of the, pr what is your opinion about what will, what the future is of the print edition? Probably my strongest belief is that the one thing that humans are really terrible at is predicting the future. And, you know, my background is also, like, I, I was a teacher of ancient Greek and Latin before this, and so, like, you know, I'm, I'm sort of an old head of these things. I don't really know what's going to happen in the future, and I'm probably behind on um, <laughs> um, futurism, but I hope that it survives. My, my hope is that it not only survives, but thrives, and that it's something that is able to, that is able to connect people in a way that they wouldn't connect otherwise. And I believe if we say there's no future for the print edition, that we're also saying in some very real way that there's no future for the city for at least the communal space and the public sphere in the city. Because right now, someone in Baltimore could watch this event rather than watching the one in Baltimore could be watching the one in Prague. I mean, not right now, it's not live streaming. But, you know, they could watch this tomorrow or whatever in Prague as much as they could in Baltimore. And they could read, um, you know, LA Weekly or The Stranger, which un unfortunately are better papers than ours. I want that not to be the case. I want to be a better paper than either one of them are. Um, but if you just want to go for the quality of the writing and stuff like that, you can read online from anywhere. And so I feel like a, a tremendous part of it is that print editions, whether they're um, daily papers, whether they're alternative weeklies, are connected to cities in a way that, that the internet can't be. No matter how much we're carrying around, the Google will tell us you know, specifically what's happening on our block. I just I don't think that that, has the, that, that gets so niche. That, and you can, you can curate your own source of information so heavily that my hope is that we don't, if we give up on the print edition, we give up on each other. And so maybe there is no hope. I, I <laughs> um, long term, I'm just a tremendous pessimist in the world. Like you also can't study ancient civilizations without seeing like imminent decline right around the corner. <laughs> and they're like, everything's ruined. But I hope in, in my daily life, I'm a little bit more optimistic that um, maybe we can all like be this, this, the other great thing is we were born with print in this country, but we're also the only country that doesn't have any kind of real nationality, that we're all mutts, that we're all bumping into each other and mixing, and that papers helped that happen, and papers engendered that, and made the city grow up as it did in America, and so I have zero predictions, but I have hope, not really, but I, I have to <laughs> Oh my gosh. In the face of hopelessness, I act as if I have hope. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask one more, one last question. Um, so you talk a lot about like sort of us as readers working together with you as the writers um, and the media. How, like on a practical level, how, like what do you advise us as readers to do to help keep print around or help keep you guys honest and doing your best work? Um, that's a great question. I mean, on the one hand, um, buy advertisements for the paper, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that shouldn't be my, um, that shouldn't no be my, my line, but call us. I mean, so we get, we have these, this dedicated core of letter writers, um, you know, some really great, Arnell Custis Butler, and some really like long-term um, 
sort of almost, almost columnists. They've been writing letters for so long. <laughs> Ready to call us out and letter writers. I mean, commenters online now too. But you know, serious this last week, we had really serious um, letters coming from people taking issue with a story that we wrote about child abuse that, that had to do with one of, in the story, we felt we had to run because it had to do with one of our own contributors. And so that was a real bind for us. How do we not cover this without seeming like we are biased and trying to hide what was happening because it was a contributor of ours and then cover it and we were really attacked by covering it and it was a great discussion to have happened. So it was an uncomfortable discussion, but it's the kind of discussion that that should be happening. It's the kind of thing with every story. People should say, hey man, you guys are covering the white L of the city way too much. Hey, why aren't you covering this? Why aren't you covering that? Look at all of these class issues that you're ignoring. Look at my wife calls me out every day that we haven't covered the damn incinerator that they're building um, over in Curtis Bay yet. I mean, every morning I wake up here and she's one of the best. Like, when you see someone that you know with any media on the street, give them Give them shit for what they're not doing as much as for what they are doing. Why aren't you guys doing this? Give them shit. It, it, <laughs> it helps. Then you can go yeah. back to your editor and say, hey, these people are really like busting my chops that we're not doing this. You know, they're right. We really should do this. Um, but vocally, and then, you know, if you have, if, if you lose your job and get unemployed and have some extra time and stuff, Just call so you. media watch blog. <laughs> Um, oh, not call you. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, I yeah. wish. That would be great if, if um, I could be offering jobs to. Um, <laughs> no, but start blogs, start watching, read carefully, and, and um, raise hell when, when you think that it, what's happening isn't, isn't right. And, and that's still not enough. And there's, I think there's never enough. Um, you know, make songs, making fun of the paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Humor goes a long way. Make, make fun of any of the media people when they do stupid things. Yeah. And, um, you know, then we'll be embarrassed enough to maybe listen. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>